Everybody get caught slipping once. They got gang graffiti on the wall and shit with my name on it. You feel me? Yep. Bonnie on the side. And a shooting that killed two brothers inside of their own home. So if there's anything to help our children save our babies, to save our streets, and for us to be able to walk the streets again. Parishioners hit the floor and ran for the doors. One person hit in the leg outside the church. Bang, bang, bang. It was some mass chaos, mass confusion. It was like rapid fire. It was ba 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 ba. A suppression task force made up of law enforcement from Mercer County hit the streets to quickly solve shootings and murders. That we're still piecing together to try to make sense of, and I wouldn't want to elaborate any more than that. Racking my nigga, breaking shit. You already know. Now, I was born and raised here, but yeah, my father came from the Bronx, and then my mother. Had. I was born and raised here. Yeah, we, we really lived like the city, like when we was little little kids, like for real. We used to run up and down on the buildings and shit in the downtown area, cause where we stayed at. We used to play all up on the state buildings, running up and down the steps on the roof, rolling in the grass, we used to snow. We used to ride, we used to go on down the sled. We got the big reservoir in Trenton, New Jersey. We used to fucking fly, slide down the reservoir when it was snowing and shit. We was crazy when we was kids, man. We was crazy. This is a good city, man. We used to have a lot of historical shit here. We used to have a lot of events here every year. We used to have a lot of events, period. They used to have something every year, Heritage Day downtown. It was like a big festival, people selling shit, music. And like right in the heart of the downtown, there used to be a um, stage with music and all of that. They used to be big for the city. And over the years, you know what I'm saying, they just stopped having it. So We used to have that. That was a big thing. Um, they used to have something for the kids, teenagers and everybody. Um, there used to be carnivals coming here every year, maybe two of them. I don't want to be wrong, maybe two or three, but they used to be spread out throughout the county. One used to be in Trenton, one used to be like out in the Hamilton area, and another one out there by the uh, Mercer County Park. They used to have them every year, so we used to have a lot of events here, you know what I mean? Over the years, a lot of shit slowed down, but it's a historical city. I think most people that live here, they, they're happy to be where they're from, you know what I'm saying? I know I'm happy where I'm from, you know what I mean? I'm proud to be where I'm from. I know a lot of people that was born and raised in Trenton, New Jersey, they feel the same way, straight up. But yeah, he eventually, he eventually went back to New York, you know. It always just been me, my mother, and my sister. Schools. Shit, I went to Joyce Kilmer, I think my first two years. Um, Cadwater, Cadwater Elementary, out West Trenton. Went to Cadwater uh, Middle School. I went, I did one year at Our Lady Cathedral. And then the rest of my years, I finished out in Granville. And then my high school came, um, my first year was in Trent High. I went there for a semester. But then it was off to Yon High, and then it was uh, back to Granville, because by then Granville had a high school, and it was back to Granville. But they, it, I don't know, I think their money wasn't right, or something was going on, because they switched from the main facility they had to, like, this Masonic temple. And it was a little different, because that shit was like a free fall in there. When school was over at the end of the year, in our last years, you know, everybody just got passed, you know what I mean? It wasn't no ceremony, it really wasn't no nothing. It was crazy how that was. The years was weird. It was right after 9-11. I can't make it seem like she was just like a single parent for a while, but so, uh, I like to credit to King. He's my stepfather. Yeah, he used to box, uh, King Rigger. And he, he the one that showed me the whole boxing shit. So, the highlight of his career is that he fought Otto Ogadi in the early 90s. I think he beat Otto Ogadi. I remember because he came home or niggas was scarred. I had to learn the ropes. I was a kid, you feel me? And he the one that showed me how to fight and how to box. So that's why when I got uh, my teenage years, you feel me? My whole stance and the way I fight was structured. You know what I'm saying? During that time, you know what I'm saying? I was also taking martial arts. I did a little bit of time. I got a regular ass karate school. But the martial arts school really didn't last. I think it was the money thing. My mother ain't really had the money at the time. So uh, Mr. Nass, you know, he knew Wayne Chi. And he was a black dude that was really into like the Japanese culture. He had the whole long braided ponytail and we used to dress up and everything. He, he was dope. I learned a lot studying with Mr. Nass. And you know, um, that was my early teen years too. So I, I did a lot during them years, a whole lot. When I was about 14, 13, moved back up by the projects and shit. And I mean, that's when I was of age and I started running outside, you know, going to little parties and shit like that. Hanging out with friends, staying out, not coming home. You know how it go. Gangs, when I was 15, when I was back when I was doing a little music shit. Me and my nigga Kashi. We got people in our family doing music, you feel me? My relative, Diamond D. You know what I mean? With the famous DITC crew with um, Fat Joe and all of them. You know, 
know, his relative up in, in Philly, they used to do music with Beans, um, Beanie Siegel. So, you know, niggas was just motivated to do music, and we used to be writing and hitting the studios. You know, we was young. You know how it go. It was like 17 when the whole Damu shit occurred and shit. You know what I mean? I, I was probably like 17 in 2002. That's the reason why I need to chop it up with y'all. Because that gangland shit on History Channel, that shit made my whole city seem ignorant. They were doing what they had to do for views. Now we got all this YouTube shit we all know now. They was capping for views, you know, making my city look ignorant. And, and that ain't what it is, you feel me? Nah, I ain't talking about the niggas that was on there, you know what I'm saying? I know Messiah personally. I ain't talking about the, the homies that was on there, bro. I'm talking about the History Channel, the production company. You feel what I'm saying? The way they made it look, you know what I'm saying, with the editing. They a bunch of cats. They got gang graffiti on the wall and shit with my name on it. You feel me? Like, not even... Not even knowing, you know what I mean? They ain't talk to me, they ain't talk to nobody. They just talk to three people out of 500. For sure. Yup. Bonnie Hunters. I was bar here in the early 90s. That's the first started seeing him in my city, probably like around 2003. Around the time the homie Devil Lane had died. Devil Lane was older than me. But you know what, let me tell you something about Devil Lane. Blood was really from the West Coast. He was from out there. I think he was in the Navy. And then he moved here to Trent, New Jersey. But Devin Lane was just living regular. A nigga just knew where he was from. He wasn't trying to push the Damu car. He was just living his life as a solid nigga, man. Devin Lane, he wasn't out here pushing bloods, though, you feel me? Like, he wasn't out here pushing the lines trying to have niggas follow him. Devin Lane was living his life as a grown man. Niggas just knew he was some bloods, you feel me? And he always co-signed shit or didn't co-sign shit when he seen niggas moving a certain way. Nigga might be rocking something wrong or saying something the wrong way. That's what I seen him doing. He wasn't ever trying to function with niggas on no blood shit. He did his own thing. So he got killed by a crip in the early 2000s, you know what I'm saying? All the dot moves in the city kind of took that personally. And it was fucked up how the media was all over it, like it was going to be some retaliation. But it was never no talk of that. It was the first time that, you know, a real Damu had died in Trenton. And Bloods just wanted him to go out in style. That's all it was. That's on God, like, niggas did it for the culture. For the culture of the Damus. Straight up. I found respect for the honeys when I saw the discipline they had and the respect they showed civilians. The leaders of PHB took a liking to me. He sent one of his little homies to bring me to a spot they had around 2004. It's probably like 17 then. Yeah, we was living on the Willow. The houses made, you know what I'm saying? It was right across the street from the projects. So, I mean, that's, where, that's where I was raised at. I mean, my grandmother and my grandfather, the Glovers, I mean, they owned a penny store in North Trenton and they eventually migrated over to Beak Street. And all we used to do was fight, knock niggas out, we're just doing what teenagers do. We was young. I already had a couple years in. So I used to roam around and we did a lot of fighting back then. Trenton had their own little gangs already and shit. You know what I mean? Starting West Trenton. You know what I mean? They got a Roger Gardens. That's the half a stack. We used to call it back in the day. It's Roger Gardens. You got the whole Hoffman area up there on Style. It's saying 801st. Got down the hill. Uh, Hermitage Ave. You know what I mean? They was on um, Blacktop back then. Blacktop, you got down Spring and Forsake area, you know what I mean, you got up north where you go up to uh, the boulevard, you got all down there by Suites, and you got Fountain area up there, you got the 682 boulevard, um, Dolly Homes, that was Divine Land, Divine Land Posse, you got Wilbur Section, 701st, 100 block Walnut, 200 block, 280, 425, down South Trenton, DBN niggas, you know what I'm saying, so it, it, was, it was already a lot of shit going on. And you know how it is during that age, between like 15 and 18. Yeah, that's probably what kept my ass out of jail, bro, for real. During that time, I was really at work during the days. And we did all our riding at night. We used to ride at night, straight up. You know what I mean? During the daytime, these were the work did what they had to do. And they got nighttime. And they got, they got real spooky out. They got real. I had left home. I wasn't really living there like that. I was running around. I was living here, living there. Friends, family. I got back with him and got put on by three homies. Junebug, Red Bear, and B-Dog, repping Five Line, Bounty Hunter. I learned the difference with the sets, East and West, and the history of every gang that was in my city. We had TTP, Black Peace Stones, UBNs. It's, we ain't up here doing no lies, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I want to get that, I want to get that established. The, the, the first down moves in the city, the first down moves in the city was Perry Street. The only down, I don't want to see nobody names, but West Trenton and the brothers down Perry Street, you know what I'm saying? They was the first down moves in the city, straight up. And then we came in, we had a little more knowledge, we had the history, and we was putting it down on Crips, just like they was. You know what I'm saying? We ain't really to have too much 
Damu beef and the city bloods on bloods until the numbers got into like the thousands. Everybody started mixing and mingling, you know what I'm saying? And that's how shit happens. When everybody start mixing and mingling, that's how shit happens. And I think that's how shit got out of whack. You feel me from the start. When I was doing what I was doing, I explained to all for, to all the brothers and all the sisters, you know what I mean? We doing what we doing. You know what I mean? It's all love for everybody, but we need to stay we need to stay in our business because that's how it is. If we a family, we a family. You know what I mean? We roll together, we stay in the same house. We go through hell together, we up together, you feel me? And that's what it is. You leave from with us, and you go hang with people from somewhere else or people that's claiming other shit, you got to expect something to happen. They got beasts or they own that you don't know about. There's other shit going on. Hell yeah, I did. I mean, everybody get caught slipping once. I was young, though. That was in the beginning. You know what I mean? It would have been my fault if something happened because I was out of bounds, you feel me? The niggas was getting money in that area right there, you feel me? And I, and I shouldn't even have been there. I was out of bounds doing what I'm doing and being who they be, but... I know them for years, like I said, with somebody I knew for years, so I got that pass. You know, I, I ain't never slip again. But when the Damus hit the city, it was two small cliques, and they was on two separate sides of the town, but they fucked with each other. And then that shit hit the projects where we at, because a couple of the homies used to come up there and fuck with a couple of our brothers. A couple of niggas started falling under them. A few of us turned power rules, and there was about seven to eight of us that fell under the Bonnie Hunter car. The treetop power rules got started by a brother who claimed he was triple OG. And he was 30-something years old. He said generals and five stars. We shut down all the sets that didn't have a real connection to the West. That shit we was doing, that shit that was going on, that shit was protocol. It wasn't nothing personal. It wasn't like niggas didn't like niggas. It wasn't like niggas had something against niggas. You feel what I'm saying? We let them know. They can't wreck them sets like that. Because number one, we knew, we knew they didn't have a connection to the West. If they was, if they was claiming the five, you know what I'm saying? And it had generals and lieutenants and five stars, we knew it was no real connection. So that's the only reason why, you know what I'm saying, that transpired like that. Mostly all the hoods that was, uh, that was out here, you know, repping the West Coast, um, a lot of them didn't have a real connection to the niggas over there, to the homies over there. So most of them ended up being part of East Coast sets, and that's how the numbers got so big. Really, the numbers were so big because there was a lot of power rules and shit running around. But when the power rules switched over and shit, they, they started claiming, you know, East Coast-based hoods, and that's how that went. It wasn't because niggas was on some cocky shit. Even today when niggas mention it, it ain't because niggas on some cocky shit. We just telling the story. We had the second many murders out here, the uh, GKBs, the G-Shans, um, the non-trades. They don't call them non-trades out here where I'm from. They call them tech. They used to call them non-tech. Uh, Ma Pa Rules. They was calling themselves Bix Bix Deuce Ma back then. And then they switched over to Ma Pa Rules. We had some Little Park Pa Rules. Um, Bounty Hunters. I mean, we had the Five Now Brims out here as well. Bob now Brems was here, I think, by a homie named Hollywood. And, you know, they lost one of the younger soldiers. It was a younger homie, little homie named Rob. You know, when he died, you know, they, they whole little clique just kind of split apart. I had ran into a homie um, that was out in the West Trent Projects before. This was a couple years back that uh, that was Bloodstone Villain. You know what I'm saying? This was a couple years back. There wasn't no blood in the city that could tell me what I was or what I wasn't. I knew, I knew my structure or what I was a part of. I knew how real this was. You know what I'm saying? So I never had them issues where it was bloods coming to me telling me that, oh, I'm from the East Coast. You know what I'm saying? I represent something from Watts. I can't do that. I never, them, them words never crossed me. You know what I'm saying? Even during all the battles and the wars that was in the streets, that was over other shit. That was over personal shit. I, that shit never happened with me. But we was young, so even we was manipulated. In 2005, a group of homies got locked up on murder charges. That happened because a 32-year-old new gang member named Tremaine Johnson, a.k.a. Soldier Boy, got pulled over with the gun and told the police everything he knew about the bounty hunters. You know, to this day, that shit was sad as hell, man. You feel me? We live by certain rules, and you know. So then you know this case happened, and them young boys brought his name up in there, you know, just because niggas was with the niggas that was running with the same crew. I honestly don't even believe that, you know, he called for them to do that to be 100. That's why you hear me talk about the migration. Because, you know, protocol called that. Not only was that some other shit, but, you know, it was a lot of other shit going on behind the scenes. You know, they was not who they say they was. You feel me? So they got up there and did what they did. And that fucked up the whole credibility for everything he had stood for. You know what I'm saying? There was a lot of people that were scared, man. You know what I'm saying? For no reason. Niggas, niggas being feared for their life, you know, because they got bad intentions. When people got bad intentions, they're going to seem scared. They're going to be tense. The whole order going to seem off is because they got bad intentions. And they trying to keep it together. That's how I go. Feel me? Call him Babyface. You know what I'm saying? We used to, we used to call him Reggie. And uh, somebody told me that, that, that Blood told too. He was eventually involved in the investigation. 
he just had to stop seeing him one day. You know what I'm saying? So he, he had answered all. He had answered it for us. You know, I remember when B Dog that came back around, cause they had hit his house, and uh, he was living on the Calhoun Street side, and he had hit his house one morning and shit, and uh, the homies was there, and B Dog was telling me that when they grabbed him up, you know what I'm saying? That that blood had told straight up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man, I learned a lot during them years, man. You know what I'm saying? I learned a lot. People don't be who they say they are. The nigga Gino. Yeah, yeah, he's from North Trent. I know you're talking about. Yeah, Gino told, too. Yeah, see, Gino's story was fucked up, see, because he was just trying to be up under us, and he was a fake bounty hunter, feel me? He ended up on and holding some money and shit like that, and he was in fear for his life. And he eventually told. You know what I mean? He eventually went to the police. His mother worked at the police station. That's something that them niggas ain't know. You know what I'm saying? And he eventually told and played a part in all of that, too, that was going on. This made other homies from other parts of NJ link up with Trenton Hunters and explain how he lied about his position and was low-key in Trenton. The homie Marlo from the niggas name brought the truth to the homies. In 2005, the story behind that is this, we just found out that, you know, um, Grown men was using younger men for their own financial gain. That, you know what I mean? They was doing, they took a small amount of power they had and extended it. And they never thought that niggas would eventually be in contact with niggas. See, now that I'm older, I understand. You feel me? And at this point, you know, a lot of us, we just back and forth out of town. I get the car and hit the feds, came and locked my nigga up. He got hit with a kingpin charge, whatever he was doing. And you know, the way New Jersey laws is, they were saying he had a long criminal history or whatever. So my nigga ended up getting a life sentence. And in that case, it was niggas from the other side of town that told on him. Now that's two times that the law that had their eyes on us is fucking with us and not even knowing it's just kids running around and they finding a way, you know what I mean, to do what they do. They taught the homie hood how blood don't pay dues by the fire. And the real blood would never manipulate his younger homies for the money and clout. And if we wanted to do banking the right way, he would introduce us to a real OG. Yeah, Marlo from Nixon Gardens. That's my nigga, man. For real. He'd be back and forth Nixon Gardens and over here on the East Coast and shit. But see, Marlo ran into some shit because niggas was hating on him. You know what I mean? A lot of niggas was making up shit. You feel me? And this is weird because somebody would come in and try to teach you right and teach you the truth. And you might look at it like a nigga might be hating. Sometimes the truth hurt, bro. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes the truth hurt, my niggas. It, it always been like that. So, you know, he ran into some shit out here as far as hatred. You feel me? Because niggas, he was trying to school niggas on the right way to do things. A lot of niggas ended up in limbo. There was a lot of rejects running around. They didn't know what to do. They start reaching around on the internet, sending letters just to link up with anybody who was in position of power. Young boys, you gotta let young boys live. You know what I mean? My only word to, to young boys is, you know what I mean? If they're going through something, it ain't gonna last for long. You know what I mean? Niggas be down and niggas be feeling some type of way. Niggas gonna get through that. You know what I mean? I've been there, you know what I mean? We all been young before, you know what I mean? I don't, I, don't, I don't try to tell young boys what to do or whatever. They got to live their experiences. I ain't going to let them walk into a ditch, you know what I mean? If I see they walking into a situation or something, I'm definitely going to tell them, like, hold on, bro. But if that ain't the case, you now, I mean, you got to let them live. I don't ever try to school young boys. They they own man, my nigga. They know what they doing. They ain't stupid. They grown men, too. You know what I mean? I was a grown man when I was 15 in the month. Like, we was, we was making, we was, we was moving around like we was grown since we was young. So I know they know what they doing. You feel me? As the years go, you see the youngest, they've been getting they've been getting smarter and smarter. My my daughter, she nine years old now. She's smart as hell. Just just I know like y'all kids is, you feel me? So I mean, I don't try to tell the young boys nothing. I salute the young boys, you feel me? And they give it back, straight up. We all grown now, we doing grown things, you know what I mean? Everybody adults, they ain't really running around the streets no more, you know what I mean? I got my own little businesses, you know what I mean, my own little car detailing shop. I got a uh, fashion design. Yeah. Wrote a couple joints, you know what I mean? Music, um, Stories, uh, movie scripts, all that shit. Couple joints. Hell yeah. I had imagination as a child, bro. You know what I mean? I did a couple narrations for a couple documentaries. You feel me? Straight up. Narrated a couple documentaries, some history shit, some, some other shit. So, you know, got our hands in a lot. Everybody doing grown shit. Straight up. Shit. Make sure you pray every day. Shit. What else can I say? Make sure you pray every day. You know, stay strong and teach your kids to be strong. You know what I'm saying? He was a five percenter, you feel me? And he had my mother doing a five percenter thing. So, so when they used to go out, he would uh, we would go stay with Miss Grigger. That's his mother over in Fraser Homes. It's a lot of strong people come out of Fraser Homes. Straight.
to uh, be with his family and shit. And I learned a lot of deer, too. I got to run through the tapes and, you know, mimic the training I was seeing and all that. So a lot of that shit played a part in it as well. So eventually it started letting me tag along. And I started going along with them up to Joe Frazier's gym in Philly. So I trained. That's why I learned how to hit the bags, hit the speed bag. And my shit got a little sharper. The whole martial arts crossover to martial arts just came, it was just natural, you know what I'm saying? I was already into the fighting shit, and I just seen that was just like a whole, uh, a whole nother level to fighting and shit, and I really just took to it, straight up. Steve Chambers had a, a martial arts school over on Spring Street, and that was probably the most popular martial arts school in the city. Like I said before, you know, my mother's situation was a little different, so you know, I'm glad that she linked me up with Mr. Nass, and he was a close friend of my uncle's, so I guess my uncle dropped it up with him. And, you know, he, he started coming every weekend and two days out the week. And I would go link up with him and we would go down by on uh, Route 29, right next to the uh, the Waterworks Company. It's a small little white bridge. And right along there, facing the river, we would just practice and train for hours. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot of patience. I learned how to deal with people. I learned a lot, not just fighting, you know, dealing with the whole Wing Chi and the, and the Asian culture. On the flip side, you know, shit was all good. Like, we had a lot of stuff in the city, you know, years ago, even before all the events I was telling you about, Heritage Day and all of that. I used to teach at a Magic Marker company, um, skating ring, drive-in movie theater. I used to be out before my time. See, back then, growing up, it was just me and my sister. Shit, my sister really was all I had growing up, you know what I mean? We used to play and play fight. We was crazy when we was kids. She was strong. She always been strong, you feel me? Like back then, I wouldn't say my sister was a tomboy, but she can keep up, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Long hair and shit, she still kept up. But it was crazy. i never forget this time when me and my uh, relative was running around acting the fool, me and my relative walk. And she was chasing behind us and running around. We was looking over on Rutherford. And in between the buildings, it was like these, uh, the black metal gates like to be in the projects. And she was trying to hop the gate and follow me. Since she was like seven years old, yo. And she jumped over that gate and got her whole arm caught up in the gate. I'll never forget that. That shit scared the shit out of me. It scared my mother, too. And I mean, ambulance came. There was a whole bunch of shit. But it only happened because she was following us. And I always felt bad for that shit. And she, you know what I mean? She was just following us. We was young, running around. And me and him, was, he was chasing me. Or I was chasing him once. And she was behind us, you know, just following us. I'll never forget that. But she had a couple stitches. Of, you know, it didn't affect her in the long run or nothing. My mother got a big side of the family, you know, on her mother's side, you know, that's my grandfather and my grandmother that owned the penny store. And, you know, he was like one of the first black men to be involved in uh, radio here in Trent, you know, on the gospel side. And uh, his father was part of the, was one of the first black judges here in Trent uh, back in the day. That's my great-great-grandfather. All of their kids, my uncles, mostly all of them went to the military. And then my grandfather went to the military as well, my mother's father. And he passed away when she was real young uh, from prostate cancer. I think he was about, he was around my age when he passed away. And this is uh, early 30s. But she, I'm 35 now myself. When I think back, you know, a lot of things that was going on when we was younger, you know, my mother took care of her, she did her thing. But a lot of the pain she was going through, that might have came from, you know, losing her father at a young age, and, you know, bouncing around with family. So. You know, I try to be patient with my mother. Grandmother, my mother's mother, um, the one who kept us in church. My grandmother, Eunice, she always, you know, was always there as well. She was doing her thing as a model and working when we was real younger and um, we was real small. And she she always played her part, you know, in making sure we had some type of class and, you know, we wasn't out here on some ratchet shit. So, you know, a lot of shit I learned from my, my mother's mother too as well. A lot of strong women took part in raising us when we was kids. My real grandfather died in the 70s. So after she remarried, um, her new husband, my grand, which I consider my grandfather, because he's all I've known since I've been born. And he always been there for us. He, he taught me a lot about life. Taught me a lot of, when I was younger about, you know, how men would be when I get older, you know, when I was up against, you know, he's nature. Christine Brown. I gotta say her name on here because I gotta salute her for that because she would come back and forth, you know what I'm saying, from uh, New York to here, and she would make sure she would round us all up. All my, my relatives in New York, all my little cousins, 
uh, me, my sister. It was at least about six of us. And she would make sure she rounded us up. You know, she used to spend a lot. Now that I'm older and I look back, she used to spend a lot of money, you know, taking us to Six Flags, uh, having fun, hitting hotels. And when we was young, that shit was like adventure. So, you know, my grandmother made sure that. She would put the effort in. She had a little, little, small, green, cool, little Dodge. We always used to pile up in there. I remember that shit. And she would put the effort in to make sure we go back and forth to New York to see my father. Mount Rozzy. Mount Rozzy, she flies hell. That's my father's sister, you feel me? They was from over in uh, Marcus Garvey. I think they call it the Floss. It was over there in Marcus Garvey. And she used to run around, hang out, flipping on mattresses. And, you know, I got a chance to really see Brooklyn for on, on a, in a real way, you feel me, out there hanging with my family, you know what I'm saying, from a small kid all the way throughout my teenage years, even when I was running the streets, I made time and made sure I was there when my grandmother was coming, because I knew I was linking up with family, and we was doing some real family shit. I got a brother in New York, up in Brooklyn, and two twin sisters. And, you know, my father, he might have been dealing with that, taking care of them and having us. And me being a man now, having kids, you know, losing relationships and stuff like that, I kind of understand in a certain way. I never was mad at my father. You know, when you're younger, you hold this type of anger. But as you get older, you start to go through shit. You understand, you feel me? So, like, I, I never blame my mother or my father, you know, for, for things that go on. You know, life is life. Ups, ups and downs, it is what it is. And I probably wouldn't have had a relationship with them if it wasn't for my grandmother. Until this day, I love them, man, and my niggas. And that's off the strip of my grandmother, you know what I'm saying? And they too do music up in New York, you know what I'm saying? That's in neighborhood. Like I said, I come from a family up on up in the Bronx, you know what I'm saying? That's that's the birth of hip hop, you know what I mean? So that shit is in our blood. And they also got music going on and they doing their thing up in New York. We all we be on bikes and bikes and backflipping and playing basketball and doing all of that, so you end up migrating. Next street, next thing you know, you're two streets over, next thing you know, you're hanging everywhere in the neighborhood, you feel me? That's, that's just how it is, so. There was a nightclub called XL. Used to be City Gardens. That's where Kashif had the first rap battle. He was when he was into the battle rap part. Bro used to be into that battle rap. I mean, I was more of a writer making songs. But we used to go like, to the Vine Studios. The Vine used to be one of the producers that used to work with them. Um, Poor Righteous Teachers. Poor Righteous Teachers, one of the famous um, hip hop conscious rappers that came out of the city back in the early 90s. He was dedicated to that shit going like every night. You know what I mean? But, you know, I, I appreciate Devon because um, when I think back when we was younger, he wasn't really charging us nothing. You know what I mean? He was doing that shit off the strength because he seen some younger dudes trying to, you know I mean, do something positive, get off the street, come to the studio. So I, I respect Devon for that. I ain't going to forget him for that. Straight up. Yeah, we got fans from out here. Uh, Troy Benson. Uh, from the Eagles. Yeah, Troy Vincent. He from Irish Trent, New Jersey. Uh, the famous Sarah Dash. Rest in peace. She just passed away. Uh, you know, big oof from out here. Now, I mean, we, we proud of everybody that come out of Trent that make it famous. You know what I'm saying? We'll never look at them funny. I don't know. She got locked up. I was uh, going on 17. So I kind of slowed down with the music a little bit. I still was writing every day, writing every morning, writing at work. I still was doing that. But I wasn't going to the studio like that no more. And Watt, that's my uh, my uncle's son. He and Watt named after my grandfather, Wallace Huntley. So you know, we became real tight. We was like brothers growing up. He probably one of the most laid back people I know. You know what I'm saying? Just go to work, make his money. So he the one that introduced me to like the video games and the parties and all of that. Cause I was younger. I, I ain't have no video games growing up. I think I had a Super NES when I was about seven or eight. And I was never really big on video games. You know, my mother, she did what she could. You know what I mean? She did what she could, and I respect that. She's been going over there every weekend. You know, he had all the new shit. We still blockbuster to play the games. And, you know, my Uncle Jerry made sure we had fun and shit like that. Like, Jerry gave me my first job. And that's why I say, you know, I was at work when a lot of shit was going on because I was battling back and forth for my last years of high school, struggling, you know, uh, making money, going to work so I could have the things that I needed because I was a teenager. You know, and beginning of high school, I'm still wearing the same sneakers, you feel me? Niggas starting to rag on me, you know, we call that shit cracking out here, niggas started cracking on me. So I, I had to get my shit together, so I started working, you know what I mean, doing what I had to do. And you know, it was Jerry, you know, he had me at work every day, I was working with him from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., sometimes 7 to 8, detailing. $120 of detail, split it down the middle, I was making some money. Young age, I was doing that, going to work every day, you know what I'm saying, but forgot that. You know, when I get older, I have kids. I got to do what I got to do for them. 
Like, I never abandoned my kids. I never abandoned my daughter, ever. You know what I'm saying? And I learned that from him, watching him take care of my relative my whole life growing up. Because he was my right-hand man. So anything new he had, anywhere he was going, it was coming right from my uncle. And I knew where it was coming from. And I watched him bust his ass just to take care of my relative. We was wild when we was teenagers, man. You know what I'm saying? We went to all the parties. We used to be at a movie theater every weekend. And they had shut the parties down for a little bit, I guess, because it was a lot of fights. Parties were going all weekend, every weekend. People didn't care who showed up to their house parties. And the parties at the Pennington Firehouse and the Y, legendary in Trenton. Well, back then, we used to have the parties at the YMCA, you feel me, on, on Pennington Avenue. They used to have parties from probably before our time, early 90s, 80s. When we came into, you know I mean, it was about the year 2000. We became of age and, you know I mean, they were still having parties there. She had all four sides of the town used to meet there, you feel me? All four sides. You had West Trenton niggas, South Trenton niggas. And now that I'm older and I think about it, niggas that was from like South Trenton and East Trenton, they had a lot of art. They come way in out, way out to West Trenton where it's mainly just North and West because that was the area where the borderline was on North and West. That was the borderline where the parties was at. So they had a lot of art. They used to go down. It was easy for niggas to get jumped back then. You had to fight growing up in Trenton. But it was a lot to do in the city back then. The movie theaters used to be packed like nightclubs back then. Yeah, it was the YMCA and the Pennington Firehouse, um, the Masonic Temple. All them spots used to not mean have parties. And the Pennington Firehouse became a big ass thing for our generation. Everybody used to go there. But like I said before, north, south, east, west, all sides of town, everybody used to go to some events. And afterwards, now I mean, all the different tribes would just clash, you feel me? I can remember, I can remember one time when we had to walk. We, we was young, we was all really deep as hell. North Trent was pretty deep, uh, Wilbur section was uh, like 100 deep. They was always deep, Wilbur section was always deeper than everybody. Like Wilbur section used to come in spots 200 deep. And they would have niggas that was 20, 18, you know what I mean? And, we were 16, 15 back then. Wilbur we section used to be deep back then. I remember everybody walking from the party. It took over, took up the whole goddamn Pennington Avenue, one side of the street. Like, you know, one tribe on this side, another tribe on that side. And everybody just walking in. This is like a main road. The road I'm speaking of is like a main road. They got like grocery stores and fucking foot lockers and gaming stores and all that shit on it. It's, it's a busy highway. We had that whole shit filled up walking up. Once niggas got to the borderline, like where the city was at, because the township cops would follow us as we was walking. Yeah, but see, this, they side of town was a little bigger, so it was like 200 of them on this side of the street. There was like 100 of us over here. So maybe two, 300 of us got the whole street filled up walking. Police can't even do nothing. They just in the middle riding through. We got to the borderline, niggas used to just go down. Niggas get busy. That shit started when we was young. Shit over time, shit, everybody really was at it. Shit, I, I ain't gonna speak on too much, but yeah, I remember one instant age where we was coming up when niggas wanted to make some real money, so we was maneuvering around, I guess, the niggas that was right that wasn't feeling that. So, um, you know, a couple of the homies, you know, we had a couple words or whatever, and niggas, you know, we parted ways. So later on, what they tried to do was say something to a couple of the females, feel me, try to say something to some of the homegirls. They ain't said that, they said to the homegirls. So when the homegirls told me what they said, I already knew what it was going to be, you feel me? So, niggas was up on the roof, niggas was chilling, niggas was squatting in different places. Niggas saw them before they was coming, niggas was just stupid. We had a lot of mops and brooms, you know, we was able to clean up. Word up. Ain't, ain't nobody get hit, you know what I mean? Niggas ran up out of their car, spend and all of that type of shit. But that's only one instance I could say, and that was over shit. That was like, that was 16 years ago. Young, it was young, we was wild, we was hunters. Soldier Boy, Kevin Barnes, and Old Dog's brother testified at the trial. I can't really speak on that, but yeah, I know for sure that he was making music. He was older than us. For me, he had me by like 12, 13 years. And he was definitely involved with the music and shit. So yeah, that's a fact. And during that time, we definitely was hitting the studios going up to North Jersey and shit, because a couple of us was in the music, you know what I mean? So we definitely used to go back and forth to the studio. I can't remember the dates, but we used to be up there. He bumped me off on a drug case and shit back in um, 2007. Feel me? He was a good dude. He wasn't out here on the wild shit. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? I remember the, the, the generous the shit he used to do in the hood. You feel me? I remember one time the niggas going through the whole block and it's a 
it's a, a five block, like, you know, from zero to, to 500 as far as the addresses. And niggas went to every block, you know what I mean, passing out turkey. Shit was Thanksgiving time, you know what I mean? Niggas dropped the box. Niggas hit shop right in a couple other spots. Spent a whole bunch of money, you know what I'm saying? Passed out the turkeys to every house and all this shit. I remember that. It was way back then, about 07, before I nigga went to prison. Yeah, 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 I eventually got locked up. You know, we was young, and this was after the, a lot of our older niggas had got locked up. We was young, still like running around. And I can remember when some shit had happened, you know what I mean? And they must have thought that we might have something to do with it, but they was wrong, you feel me? So they going around asking questions. I never forget to seeing the FBI walk to my, my whole hood and knocking on everybody door and shit and stepping in to ask some questions. And then that very next day, while we out walking, we walk back up. They fucking warm up, Fed, state police, everybody got federal agents, state police, all of that. What they was trying to do was see what put fake people up on us. Now, now I'm older, I understand. They had us locked up back in the county to ask us certain questions. So it was people, it was two niggas actually that came up to me asked me was my name such and such and who I was and standing third, saying that they was relatives, uh, a couple of down moves in the city, and if I need anything, come holler at them. I ain't say nothing to them. You know what I'm saying? I ain't say nothing to them because that's just like the person I am. You feel me? I don't really, I ain't really friendly with everybody. I don't really speak to everybody. I slapped it all over the papers and shit. But the worst part about that when, uh, you know, after they raided us was my homegirl, she had something from old back when she was younger. And you know what I'm saying? I was young and Basically, I heard capping, you know, running around and, and hustling and, you know, just bouncing around and, and not really paying attention to my finances. And she ended up having to sit for a few weeks, you know what I'm saying? I never forgot that. And she was solid. She never tried to, never tried to tear me up for being a broke nigga back then. You feel me? They lock us up on some old warrants that I had. And um, my, my homegirl, her uncle got bumped off with us. We had some old warrants back in the day, so he had an NCIC. And he ended up staying for like two years after that off his old ass warrants, you feel me? Oh, cause he was, I mean, just at the house chilling with a couple of young motherfuckers. You know what I mean? Got caught up in some shit that we had going on. Shit, I probably lost the, uh, probably about 20 homies. You know what I mean? 18 of them to the, 17 of them to the system. Three in the streets. You feel me? Three relatives, uh, relatives of my close friends. Yeah, that was uh, 2005. That was a, uh, uh, Antoinette, Tanya, and Shauna. I mean, I never forget that. That shit touched me for real because I, I was close to their to they family. I was, it was official mob. You feel me? So when they passed, they passed in a car accident. You know what I'm saying? That shit really, that shit really touched me. And I did the best I could. You know what I'm saying? So I hold it down for them at the funeral. You know, let them know that they, they always gonna be remembered. Straight up. That was some crazy shit. I ain't seen nothing like that in a long time, you know what I mean? And we grew up seeing the Rodney King and all of that. And when that had happened to George Floyd, that was just phew. Parked down there in the, um, in the protest or whatever. We went down there to the first original one. And then we went down there on June 6th again. And you know, me feeling some type of weight don't mean nothing but... When I seen my city come out and I seen that the feeling was universal. It really touched me when I started seeing shit on the news and it was like different countries and people from all over the world that was protesting in the name of something that had happened to a black man here in America. You feel me? Because you hear certain um, stereotypes where they don't like us in other countries and we go to other countries and they treat us like shit or whatever like that. So when I had saw that, that let me know that everybody dealing with police problems everywhere in the world. You feel me? So the police kind of tried to like keep a distance to a certain extent, you feel me? Until we got on our shit, and then they had to get on their shit, you know what I mean? And it is what it is. But as far as protesting and, you know, the aura of the city, they kind of respected what was going on. And the, the police kind of just chilled and just did their job or whatever, and they wasn't really bothering people during that time.